the map, yeah, what's their community, uh, and various data visualization tools and online data stores. Is that clear? Yep. Right. The next one. Also, maybe on that point, could you, you suggested, was it Buildington that you suggested mm. at that moment as well? The guys from. Um, The problem under this heading is um, leaving people out. Now, there are two types of leaving people out. People who were not engaged, people who were outside the boundary. Um, to which there were a whole lot of things to try to engage people. Posters and flyers and Facebook groups, evolving methods of engagement and notice boards. So it's really making people aware of the opportunity and rather than just the uh, traditional techniques to try and reach out to find people who might otherwise just want to get engaged. So that, that's and there's, and there's Twitter and various other ones which we could put together to deal with that. Over the other two works, that has come up repeatedly. <laughs> about you know how do you get as many people involved as possible and how do you fairly represent and um, so I don't know whether anyone else has any kind of suggestions about ways that they've reached kind of further out to harm to reach groups. Um, I think we, we had a point here that uh, how do how do you actually reach the people who don't currently live in the area uh, uh, but maybe push to live in this neighborhood. Uh, I guess tools that the current uh, social media tools would help there as well. But the likelihood is as you go away from the area defined locally, uh, fewer people want to be engaged. So you shouldn't knock your brains out to know. Whereas the people who are in the area you might want to get as many people engaged as possible. Well, the, the, the local estate agents will probably know who wants to live there. Yes? Yeah. Maybe hack into their databases. <laughs> <laughs> I think Hacking is one way of finding <laughs> out. <laughs> there was some discussion about <coughs> hacking your email um, addresses in order to build up your own database. Very topical. <laughs> Um, over here we've got, on the plan preparation side, people don't understand the process and it was suggested that they ought to read uh, an accessible version of uh, national and local planning policies. Uh, that's a little bit, go away in the corner and read it, which I don't probably think. But I think we have other things under this process uh, where we envisage conflict, uh, I mentioned this, which is mediation and facilitated discussion because it was related to this one here. Uh, what if there's a conflict between uh, with businesses' aspirations? And clearly there's going to be a need for a mediation process with facilitated discussion because you can't have winners and losers, or I suppose you can people can walk out. Uh, but maybe some groups may find actually it isn't for them. They're not going to achieve their aims through this process. Uh, you know, like Tesco may decide to opt out rather than opt in because they can get what they want anyway. Town centre uh, first. Pardon? Town centre first. No, no, I'm saying that they could just uh, wait and come up with a proposal to extend their out centre store without even going through the government. But, is, I think it's a characteristic we discussed that the neighborhood planning is not mandatory. It's discretionary. Yes. In other words, nobody has to do one. No, no. no district council needs to have them. It, it no. will make them happen. No. This is something you... Opt if you don't have them, the developers can do whatever they like. Uh, right. No. The no. local plan and the national policies will always overrule the neighborhood plan. We're lucky in that. The London plan as well. No this without a plan. Not rather too many. Uh, no, they're, they're actually in conformity with one another, or should be, generally in conformity at least. Yeah. 
And the final one over here is that too few people vote and there's a poor turnout. So the question was, how do you turn more people out? Uh, we got into a discussion of email campaigns which can hijack the outcome anyway. Uh, but it's, it's using the electoral register, which is a, an old fashioned tool. Um, but maybe taking, uh, finding other ways of actually getting those people to turn out. And at the end, probably it is going to get taken over by people who are for or against the proposals, and usually against getting people most likely to vote. So I think there's also a slight, there's been a change to the bill as far as I understand. Chris can comment if he wants. Um, you don't have to have a referendum now. The council can just say, you're, you're close enough, go for it. Um, so there doesn't have to be a formal vote. Because once you start including employees and people who are out of the area but have an interest, there's no electoral role for them. No. So how do you get voters who are transients or working in the area but are harder to identify, never mind people just don't want to vote, who are living in the area? Yeah. So I believe it's technically correct now that a council can say, based on reasonable criteria, you are a representative, so therefore we don't need a referendum. It's also a very big cost to have a referendum. Mm -hmm. And it may not be in the best interest if it's essentially an obvious exercise. I'm not sure about that, John, but I believe government is going to bring forth proposals for businesses to have a vote. So there'll be two referenda. And yeah. the opportunity for the local authority to say the box and voting houses. Uh, the opportunity is certainly for the local authority to decide which of the two yes. results it well, likes. Is that right? Yeah. You can choose between the, can choose between so, the votes. So the original concept, system. which was nice and simple, has mm -hmm. got more and more complicated and nobody is well, can right. be certain about the outcome. One of the problems with the original concept is those that already live there can say, we don't want anything. You know, we're going to bring up the drawbridges, close the roads, we're the locals, everybody out. And that's probably not a good use of localism, especially if it's pro-growth. The basis of localism is pro-growth. If it's pro-growth, the locals are less likely to want to support that. Sorry. The basis of localism isn't pro-growth, it's the government's view of localism. <laughs> <laughs> if the locals' vote doesn't matter, then you could say... Yes, I mean, uh, people, people will go for this something is the and point. you can produce a product which isn't pro-growth, which isn't anti-growth, uh, which is, it finesses the current policy or changes it. I mean, if they decided that North Southern really didn't want tall buildings, they could, they could go for that. Can I, you can I try and rescue this to the organizers and suggest we might want to talk about yes. web tools? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, do we have it? I think that was the kind of point where we sort of pinned out a bit and, and yes. got to the end really. So I don't know whether anyone has, has covered that in, in what they've talk, been talking about or... Uh, What's the question? Too to few people turn out or the fear that not enough people will turn up to, to vote there is there is well, so if, if you define the referendum by people who are on the electoral wall, which means I'm not one of them even though I live there, then you have a pretty tried and true mechanism to have a vote. And if a lot of people just don't give a toss, then you could count that as a pro or a negative. It just depends on who the majority was that did show up. The three people who voted get their say. If you define it to be broader than that, which is business and everything else, I'm not even sure how they're going to run it, so never mind what tools Apple's depends. Yeah, like, how do you? Do we, Boris Johnson gets a vote as an employee of the, as mayor sitting in the patch side, drew boundaries around. Does everybody that goes through London Bridge Station on the way to work get a vote? Yeah. So that, do we reach out to Kent, we reach out to whatever to get those people's votes? Or do we just say, everybody put your hands up at 8.05 coming off the trains. Okay, those are the S's. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah, some of the stuff we've got might cover it. Yes, do we move on? Yeah. It's been quite, quite, quite simple. The first piece was around um, defining the neighbourhood. And we were suggesting a whole range of existing tools, uh, social media tools. And it's kind of really anything. So we had community websites, uh, uh, Facebook, blogs, forums. So anything is where the people are already. 
don't build anything new if you've got spaces where people are already. So at Bevan Neighbourhoods, we found neighborhood websites where you've got 15,000 people signed up, 5,000 uh, different users looking every day. Why build something new? And then we thought for this designing a, a neighborhood map, um, you can do it with a Google map, really. Um, just put up a Google map, get comments on the so forth. Open street map. Sorry? Or open street map. Or open street map, even better. Or Wikimapia, it's an amazing one. Or Wikimapia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or any other maps. But, but what about the fusions if we should just have one tool? <laughs> well, well, we took it a step further, which will now cover it. But we thought there was, um, we, we've got a pickup here, which we're very proud of, actually, which, which is an idea. We thought if, if we could build a tool that aggregated everybody's own maps and, and came up with a, an aggregated result, that would be kind of a neat new tool. So each person could draw their own map, yeah. plus or minus. <laughs> will go by like most people seem to have drawn this map or close to this map. Yeah, and ideally the, the, the web tool would do that it's automatically. At the moment, I've done this in the past using Google Maps and, and, and neighborhood forums to define a neighborhood and you just kind of roughly work it out and you get rid of that work. If you had a, a tool to do that, kind of neat, wouldn't you? So that's that set of um, things. And then there was reduced political influence uh, of local councillors in planning. And I think this was around using knowledge tools. Um, so we had communityplanning.net and location intelligence. I don't know what location intelligence is, but somebody else can explain it. I don't know. Where the road? No, okay. Um, <laughs> the other thing we had was. <laughs> but we, uh, we can all Google it later. Uh, the articulate and obsessed um, and underemployed. Uh, might might dominate. Uh, again, I think we, we use it pretty much did phase one. Use the tools that are out there to enable people to discuss, to express themselves, to give the opportunity to a wider portion of people to express themselves. I don't think any of these online tools are going to be completely inclusive. We're always going to miss people out, but you do broaden beyond the, the, the normal or the usual suspects. You broaden the people who can contribute. You get people contributing from uh, spending 10 minutes of lunchtime. Um, and we also had the uh, sticky board uh, as, as, a, as a useful tool. A, a specific comment on this idea of broadening the 10 minutes of lunchtime, I think is perfect, because if you want to narrow the conversation, just force people to have lots of physical meetings that they have to get to at the wrong time of day, and you'll eliminate pretty much everybody who isn't on your side. If you want to actually have a diversity of opinion, you have to make it really easy for people to offer their opinion without this big overhead of, I got to go to 16 meetings over 14 weeks, da 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 da, da. You know, So the higher the cost of contributing, the more you're going to narrow the focus. The more you can do the 10 minutes of lunch, the more you'll get diversity. And that's exactly what we're 